Hi everyone and welcome to Together What If. So Jamie, what are we talking about today? So let me put it this way. When was the last time you thought about the second coming of Jesus? The second coming of Jesus? Mm -hmm. um, when I was brushing my teeth this morning. Okay, whatever. Yeah. No, really, I, I, I don't think about that every day. Uh, I did grow up in a tradition where we talked about that a lot, but I, no, I don't think I do think about that every day. And we don't, uh, to be fair, I, I mean, I don't think about it every day, but today what we're gonna talk about as we look at this passage from 2 Peter is really talk about how the, the second coming of Jesus shapes how we live our life in the present. I want to hear about that and I, we are so glad that you are joining us to hear about that with us because together what if second peter chapter 1 verses 3 through 9 by his divine power the lord has given us everything we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of the one who has called us by his own honor and glory through his honor and glory he has given us his precious and wonderful promises that you may share the divine nature and escape from the world's immorality that sinful craving produces. This is why you must make every effort to add moral excellence to your faith, and to moral excellence, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, endurance, and to endurance, endurance, godliness, and to godliness, affection for others, and to affection for others, love. If all these are yours, they are growing in you, They'll keep you from becoming inactive and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Whoever lacks these things is short-sighted and blind, forgetting that they were cleansed from their past sins. So let me ask you, when was the last time that you thought about the second coming of Christ? If I had to guess, you don't think very much about the possibility of Jesus coming back to earth during your lifetime. You probably didn't wake up this morning saying to yourself, you know, I wonder if today is the day that Christ will return. Of course, I'm talking to Christians at this point, because if you're not a Christian, you probably associate the second coming of Christ with, you know, a weird date predicting televangelist or bizarre street preacher who holds up signs that read, are you ready? Are you prepared? I remember in high school liking this girl and wanting to be close to her, and I decided to go to church with her. And she said her, her youth group was having a rapture party. Now, I had no clue what a rapture party was, but I knew that I wanted to be where she was, so I decided to go with her. Oh, and by the way, here's a picture of me at that party. Just joking, that's actually from a Katy Perry music video, but it's kind of what it was like. A rapture party is a sanitized religious rave where the participants jump up and down to Christian rock music. And I wasn't really sure what to believe about all that, but I'd tell you it was fun to witness. The church that was hosting the rapture party, they believed that, that Jesus would return midair to call up the living and the dead to be with him in heaven. And, and that was their interpretation of passages like 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where Paul says, For the Lord himself with a cry of command, with the archangels call, and with the sound of God's trumpet will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive, who are left, will be called up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. They also believe this what is meant when Paul says in 1 Corinthians, listen, I'm going to tell you a mystery. We will not all die, but we will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised and we will be changed. It's kind of like Walking Dead meets Kirk Cameron bad movie kind of scene where the dead and the living are floating up to heaven while Louis Armstrong plays the trumpet. Now for the record, I don't believe that's an accurate interpretation of those passages. But however, I do believe that the second coming of Christ is a foundational teaching of scripture. It's been said that that the second coming of Jesus is mentioned 318 times in the 260 chapters of the New Testament. The second coming occupies one in every 25 verses from Matthew to Revelation. 
We have Jesus saying things like, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself and so that where I am, there you will be also. The second coming of Jesus gives a urgency to the life and the witness of the early Christians. They, they lived with this expectation that Jesus was going to return in their lifetime, but he didn't. And as the first eyewitnesses to Jesus' life, death, and resurrection began to die out, there arose some teachers who started misleading the church. And this false teaching is what Peter will address in his second letter. Now, the letter was written just before Peter would be martyred in Rome in around 64 to 65 AD. It's sort of a last testament to the church. And he says, Our Lord Jesus Christ has shown me that I'm about to depart from this life, and I'm eager for you always to remember these things after my death. Now, here, if you don't know, Peter was one of Jesus' first disciples. He was very vocal, he wasn't afraid to express his opinions. And he took Jesus up on the challenge to walk on water, but he was also the disciple who would deny Jesus at his crucifixion. After his resurrection, Jesus would recommission Peter to take up the cause of God's kingdom and to spread the good news all over the Roman Empire. And Peter had some run-ins with Paul, but they eventually worked it out. And legend has it that he would die by crucifixion, but not feeling worthy to die the same way as Jesus, he requested to be hung upside down. So Peter, along with the other followers of Jesus, preached and taught with a sense of urgency because they believed that Jesus was returning soon. And now that they are dying off and Jesus hasn't come back, these false teachers were saying that they were wrong. So Peter addresses the false teacher's accusations when he says, We didn't repeat crafty myths when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus. Quite the contrary, Peter says, we witness his majesty with our own eyes. He's saying that they didn't make up what they were teaching about the fact that Jesus is going to return. He says it may be delayed. And the reason it might be delayed maybe is because, well, for the Lord, a single day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a single day. And the reason behind the delay according to Peter, is that the promise of God not wanting anyone to perish, but all to change their hearts and lives. So the point behind the delay is not because they misinterpreted the, the teaching of Jesus. It's because God is patient, and God is wanting all to come to experience salvation. So Peter would say, don't see the delay in Jesus' second coming as an excuse to do whatever you want or to live however you want. Instead, see it as the generosity of God to live into the fullness of God's love. So in the scripture we read earlier, Peter is saying that, that God is the source of all that we have. That we are privileged to participate in this in-between time, in the divine nature, and that comes as God's promise. That we have everything we need to participate in the will of God. Think about it. If you're admitted into Fort Knox and told that you have full access to the gold inside the vault and you walk out only holding a small nugget, whose fault is that? If you're spiritually bankrupt, it's not God who bankrupted you. The promise of God is that when we put our trust in the life, death, resurrection, and second coming of Jesus, we have everything we need to grow in the fullness of God. Now, Peter doesn't begin with what we should do. He begins with what God has already done for us, that God gives us what we need. So we don't have to rely on ourselves. As we let our lives be directed by faith in Jesus, love will be produced, peace will be more prevalent in us, and we'll find that we are becoming more patient with God's timing and our plans, and we become kinder and have mercy towards others. As we grow in our faith, we are transformed, and we participate in that divine nature by letting the divine power work through us. And then when Jesus returns, he will find a community of followers who are living out his way on earth as it is in heaven. At least that's the expectation. So how can we begin to live our life as someone prepared for Jesus' second coming? Because I don't want you to see the second coming as something arbitrary. It's not that at some point God the Creator is going to get tired of watching us make a mess of everything and then He's going to come downstairs and send us back upstairs to our room for all eternity. When God chose to involve God's self in creation, 
God knew that God was taking a risk on us. Because love requires an element of risk every time we give ourselves to someone. And the same with God. But to show us what risk God is willing to take, God sends Jesus to be among us, and he shows us the will of God. So in a way, when Jesus taught on his second coming, he was teaching us to think about the world with the end in mind. This is what the early disciples were doing when they said, be prepared and wait and be patient and don't be caught off guard. They were teaching us how to live with the end in mind. It is the end where all the, the good parts are going to be drawn together and all the bad parts are redeemed and where the world is restored and life with God is lived in peace. And if you believe this, Peter would say, then you start living your life where you evaluate everything backwards. The hour you spend bedside of a dying patient is given value when looking at life from the end of the age perspective because it reflects the way of God. Or, or the patience of a parent with his or her children when it seems that the world is passing by is witnessed as an act of grace from an end of age perspective because it reflects the patience of God. The kind words you speak, the mercy you show, the love that you demonstrate, all of that is reflected in the person of Jesus that will see its fullness in the end of the age. It's how the world will be one day. So life from an end of age lens puts other things in perspective as well. Because it makes us consider if the fights that we're having are worth fighting for. I mean, will they matter at the end? Will the worries that we carry still be worries when Christ comes? When we engage the world from the perspective of God's overcoming grace and ultimate triumph in Jesus, we'll be able to live and serve with joy and purpose in a time marked by death and destruction. This past week, we marked the 20th anniversary of the terrorist attacks of 9-11. It was an act of hate that changed the world. And the events of that day left us as a nation in mourning as people bended on bended knees and suddenly humbled by our own vulnerabilities. The days and the months that followed, we rode a wave of emotions, grief and helplessness and anger, desire for vengeance, fear, courage, pride, hope, and love, just to name a few. And as I reflect on these 20 years later, I, I, and, and, and living in the hope of Jesus' second coming, I'm wondering if there's some lessons for us today. So two things that I, I just think about. The first one is, the second coming of Jesus lets our pain be experienced through the redemptive hope of God. Friends, I don't know what suffering you're going through, but I want to tell you this, that your suffering doesn't have the final word. For when the end comes, we're promised, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And I think this gives us the courage to, to name our pain and to see it being wrapped up in the redemptive work of Jesus on the cross. And the second thing that, that I think about is that the future return of Jesus encourages us to live the way of Jesus in the present. Because Jesus tells us that when he returns, he's going to gather people from all nations and separate the people one from another, like a shepherd would separate, separate sheep from goats. And he'll invite the sheep to be with him in his heavenly home and the goats they don't get the privilege of being in that heavenly home. So why the difference? What makes the sheep distinct? Well, Jesus implies it's really how we treat one another. He says, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And the sheep were like, um... When were you hungry, thirsty, a stranger, needing clothes, sick, and in prison, and we took care of you? And Jesus says, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. The African-American poet Langston Hughes once called for America to, be, to become the America of our dreams. The America has never been, despite all of our hopes and sacrifices. And he wrote, oh, let America be America again. The land that never has been yet and yet must be. The land where every man is free. Friends, I believe the second coming of Jesus reminds us that we don't have to let our pain define us because our pain doesn't have the last word. And the way of Jesus in the present that shows up in the future is the way of love and service 
towards others. And if we can live out those two things, I believe we can be the land that has never been yet and yet must be in the land where every man and woman is free. Amen.
On the morning of September 11, 2001, 2,976 people from 93 nations lost their lives in New York, at the Pentagon, and on Flight 93. 20 years later, we pause to remember that moment and pray for those left scarred by those terrible events. On that day, violence and hate created chaos and destroyed lives and fueled fear. On that day, lives were lost, peace was shattered, and hope was endangered. The memories haunt us, the sounds echo in our ears, and the images fill our eyes. In the midst of the pain, we light these candles of hope, and the lighting of these candles reminds us that the light of God's love was never extinguished. We light the candles, recalling the unity demonstrated among the citizens of the world coming together to mourn. We light the candles recalling the actions of first responders who showed us the face of courage. We light the candles recalling acts of sacrifice, words of encouragement, and demonstrations of kindness from strangers at home and around the world. And we light candles to remind us that we are, that we are afraid and alone, hopeless and sad, angry and vengeful, fearful and faithless, that Christ is ever present to lead us to a world filled with love and grace. We light the candles remembering the one who said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Let us pray. Gracious God, you made us in your image and redeemed us through Jesus, your Son. As we take a moment today to reflect and remember the horrors of September 11, 2001, we pray once again for you to look upon us with compassion. We pray for a continual healing of all those who suffer physically, emotionally, and spiritually from that tragic day. May your spirit breathe new life into troubled minds and broken hearts. We mourn with those who mourn the loss of life. We ask for comfort for those who feel alone and forgotten. As time passes, may our suffering give way to hope, our brokenness turned into wholeness, and love replace our fears. Teach us to be instruments of your peace and show us how to walk gently among one another and give us the tools to demonstrate your mercy among one another. May your love and your peace endure through all the ages. We pray in the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Amen. Amen.